Mr. Rosenstein, thank you very much for coming to the committee voluntarily, and uh, we appreciate uh, your service to our country and your participation in the hearing today. And <clears throat> I'll try to do a pretty short opening statement, Senator Feinstein, then we'll get right to the witness. So why are we here? Uh, I think we have a clip that I'd like to play now. This is a Mr. Rosenstein, May 1st, 2018. The way we operate in the Department of Justice, if we can accuse somebody of wrongdoing, we have to have admissible evidence, credible witnesses, we need to prepare to prove our case in court, and we have to affix our signature to the charging document. That's something that not everybody appreciates. Uh, there's a lot of talk about FISA applications, and many people that I, I see talking about it seem not to recognize uh, what a FISA application is. A FISA application is actually a warrant, just like a search warrant. Uh, in order to get a FISA uh, search warrant, you need an affidavit signed by a career federal law enforcement officer who swears that the information in the affidavit is true and correct to the best of his knowledge and belief. Uh, and that's the way we operate. And if it's wrong, sometimes it is, if you find out there's anything incorrect in there, that person is going to face consequences. Sometimes there are innocent errors, uh, but if not, you can face discipline or potentially even prosecution. That was uh, delivered at the Freedom Forum by Mr. Rosenstein, May of 2018, and you described the way the system's supposed to work. And what brings us here is the fact it didn't work that way. Uh, we know now, based on the Horowitz report that was delivered to this committee in December 2019, that the FISA warrant application process did not work the way uh, Mr. Rosenstein uh, described it in 2018. What do we know? We know that exculpatory information was withheld from the court. We know, according to Mr. Horowitz, without the Steele dossier, paid for by the Democratic Party, prepared by a former British agent working with a Russian subsource, without that dossier, there would have been no warrant issued against Carter Page. We also now know that an email was doctored to get the FISA warrant by a lawyer at the FBI. So why are we here? We're trying to find out how that happened. We're trying to find out how Crossfire Hurricane got so off script. And we're desi our desire is to make sure it never happens again. Every American should be concerned by the fact that the Inspector General found criminal wrongdoing, abuse of power, and a warrant application against Carter Page, a uh, advisor to the Trump campaign. And we're here to try to find out who knew what when. Find out, did Mr. Rosenstein, did you know? that the subsource disavowed the dossier in January 2017 to the FBI, says a bunch of bar talk and hearsay. Did you know that the FBI uh, lawyer doctored an email showing a relationship between Mr. Page and the CIA? He changed it where there was no relationship. Did you know that? And if you didn't know it, why? And we're gonna ask everybody who signed the warrant, did you know? And if you didn't know, why? And now that you know, do know, how do you feel about it? And I want the, the country to understand that the Mueller investigation was allowed to go forward with bipartisan support. I remember Senator Coons and Booker coming to me and Senator Grassley and Senator Tillis saying, let's make sure that Mueller can do his job without interference. The president was pretty hot when it came to the Mueller investigation. And we came up with legislation to protect the general counsel from being dismissed without cause. To let the country know, let the, the president know, it was important for Mueller to do his job. Now it's important to find out what the hell happened. How could it gotten to be where it, where it wound up being? What evidence, if any, was there in May of 20? 17, when Mueller was appointed by Mr. Rosenstein, that anybody on the Trump campaign was colluding with the Russians. Was there a lawful predicate to appoint Mueller to begin with? And we'll be looking at that. And we'll be looking at how the warrant was signed over and over by the highest ranking officials in this country and given to a FISA court on four different occasions over a period of months and it was full of lies 
and criminally altered. I hope you want to know that. I sure do. And you got to remember the people running the Mueller investigation are the same people that were running Crossfire Hurricane, at least until they got fired. So the warrant application that Mr. Rosenstein signed in June of 2017, the last application against Carter Page, who prepared the application? Remember Strzok and Page, March 3rd, 2016? God, Trump is a loathsome, loathsome human being. Struck, oh my God, he's an idiot. Struck, God, Hillary should win 100 million to nothing. These are the people in charge of the Mueller investigation. The FBI lawyer who altered the email after the election said, Viva la resistance. This is the FBI lawyer in charge of overseeing the Mueller investigation. And finally, on August 8, 2016, Page says to Strzok, he's not ever going to become president, right? Strzok, no, no, he won't. We'll stop it. This is why we're here. We're going to get to the bottom of all this. And we did a lot together when it came to Russian interference in our election. We had hearings, the modus operandi, the toolbox of Russia, and other autocracies for undermining democracy throughout the world. Russian interference in the 2016 election, May 2017. Extremist content and Russian disinformation online, October 2017. Protecting our elections, examining shell companies and virtual currencies as avenues for foreign interference, June 2018. Cyber threats are in our national against our national critical infrastructure, August 2018. We have looked at Russia's role in the election. Now we're going to look at the Mueller investigation. And we're going to look hard. And we're going to see if what Mr. Rosenstein said at the start of this hearing comes true. That if somebody corrupts the process, that if somebody lies to the court, they would face discipline, or maybe criminal prosecution. You describe Mr. Rosenstein the way it should work, and you gave us an indication of what happens if it doesn't work that way. Well, what will happen? There are millions of Americans pretty upset about this. There are people on our side of the aisle who believe that this investigation, Crossfire Hurricane, was one of the most corrupt, biased, criminal investigations in the history of the FBI, and we would like to see something done about it. Mr. Durham is looking at the criminality part. What is our job? Our job is to explain to the American people what the Russians were up to, and we did that together. Our job was to give Mr. Mueller the chance to do his work, and he did. Now it's our job to take the Horowitz report that showed 17 violations of the FISA warrant applications against Carter Page and try to explain how that happened and shed light on the fact that it did happen and hope the system will respond. What are we going to be looking at? We're going to be looking at General Flynn's case. We're going to be looking at the fact on January the 4th, 2017, the field office in Washington, D.C. said that there's no longer justification for General Flynn to be considered part of Crossfire Hurricane. We're going to be looking at the Mueller appointment in May of 2017 to see if there was a crime worthy of being investigated. Was there any there there? We're going to look backward so that we can move forward. We're going to hold people accountable. If you don't like Trump, fine. But this is not about liking Trump or not liking Trump. This is about us as a nation. We're talking about the nominee for president on the Republican side and his campaign being under continual investigation. We're talking about warrants being issued after the president was sworn in. 
We're talking about a two-year investigation that spent 25 to $30 million, turned people's lives upside down to see if it should have ever happened to begin with. We're going to be talking about how it got off the rails, who's responsible for getting off the rails, and making sure that they're punished appropriately, and the system is changed so in the future, no other candidate for president, no other sitting president has to go through this. That's why we're here. It's going to take a while, but we will not be deterred in our effort to get to the bottom of what I think was a very major abuse of power. Ms. Rosenstein, would you please rise? Stand. Do you solemnly swear the testimony you're about to give this committee is the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, so if you got it. Thank you. Most FBI agents, most law enforcement officers uh, risk their lives and do a job uh, to protect their country, and uh, we appreciate them. But every now and then, things get off script, and that's what brings us here today. Uh, you signed a warrant application in June of, uh, I think, 2017 to get the uh, Carter Page warrant renewed. Is that correct? Yes. Okay. Uh, have you looked at the Horowitz report? Yes, I have. I have it with me, Senator. If you knew then what you know now, would you have signed the warrant application? No, I would not. And the reason you wouldn't have is because Mr. Horowitz found that its sculptory information was withheld from the court. Is that correct? Among other reasons, yes. Yeah, and somebody actually altered an email. Correct. Right, right. So there were 17 violations that Mr. Horowitz found, but I can't stress enough to the country that he found the most egregious of all, the dossier was the only reason the Carter Page warrant was issued to begin with. And in January 2017, the man who provided Steele with all the information told the FBI it was a bunch of garbage and they used it twice more. What kind of country is this? What happens to people who do that? Did you know that? You didn't know that, did you? No, sir. Do you think McCabe knew that? I, I hope not, Senator. I do not personally know. Was he in charge of the investigation? Yes, he was. Did he ever lie to you? Mr. McCabe, uh, I, I don't believe, Senator, that uh, there were any occasions in which I identified that he lied to me. Okay. Did he ever say anything, looking back, that is perplexing to you? Uh, well, th that's a very broad question, Senator. I had a lot of conversations. Do you think he was truthful to you? Uh, well, th I believed, Senator, that Mr. McCabe was not fully candid with me. He certainly wasn't forthcoming. Uh, you know, in particular, Senator, the, with regard to uh, Mr. Comey's memoranda uh, of his interviews with the President and with regard to the FBI's suspicions about the President, uh, Mr. McCabe did not reveal those to me uh, for at least a week after he became acting director, despite the fact that we had repeated conversations focusing on this investigation. And uh, for whatever reasons, Mr. McCabe was not forthcoming with me about that. He has subsequently said publicly uh, in, in public comments he's made about the investigation that uh, his team had been leading up to certain important decisions for some time. Uh, from my perspective, Senator, they'd been in conducting this investigation for, I believe, approximately nine months. How much did you rely on Mr. Cabe's statements to sign the warrant? How much did that factor into whether or not you thought the warrant application was accurate? With regard to the warrant application, Senator, I wouldn't say that I relied on Mr. McCabe's statements. I certainly had understanding of what Mr. Cave, yeah. Mr. McCabe had told me, but the, the document stands for itself. It's 100 pages, right. and uh, I relied on what I understood to be in the application. You uh, did a scope letter, I think, August 2017, after you appointed Mueller. You know what I'm talking about? Yes, sir. Memorandum, I suppose. Uh, who prepared that? Well, Senator, the, uh, I, I don't know exactly who prepared it, I know how it came about, if you'd like me to explain. Yeah, please, very uh, quickly. The, I'm not sure how quickly I can do it. <laughs> uh, but uh, I'd asked Mr. Moe to look at the whole, uh, to look at all the relevant 
Who That's the relevant matters. Where did the information in the document come from? Did it come from the Mueller team? I believe it came from the Mueller team, but it came to me through the team that I had set up to interface with the Mueller team. Okay, the team that you sent uh, that interfaced with the Mueller team, did they make the conclusions that you need to be looking at Papadopoulos and all these people for colluding with Russia? I think it's important, Senator, to recognize you know, one of the reasons I, I was very reluctant to release these documents publicly is because we investigate people who are not necessarily guilty, and uh, so I didn't have any presumption that these folks were guilty of anything. Did you believe the that? Was, did you believe they committed a crime? I believe that there was. I understood that there was predication to investigate it. I didn't believe. Where did that come from? Who gave you that predication? Well, it came from information that came to me from the FBI initially. From was it from Page. Strzok and Page? Are those the people preparing all these documents? I don't know who was. Preparing. Were they in charge? Were they still the investigators for Mueller early on? My understanding, Senator, is that uh, Ms. Page and Mr. Strzok were working with okay. the Mueller. What input, if any, did they have into the information contained in the memo? I don't know the answer to that. Okay. Who provided the information in the memo? I'm sorry, which memo are we talking the about? The one where you lay out the, the scope, scope of the investigation. That uh, came through discussions between Mr. Mueller's team and... Uh, well, did anybody on your team recommend you look at Papadopoulos? Where did the, where did the idea that George Papadopoulos working with the Russians came from? The, the, these matters, Senator, were, I believe were already open when I arrived. Yeah, the April. point is that they were open. These are the same people doing crossfire hurricane, and they gave you a document to sign and here's my belief that they prepared the document that they defined the scope of their own investigation. Is that fair to say that you were just a conduit for it? Well, I'm relying on information that's coming up. Yeah, well, you didn't do an independent investigation yourself, did you? My job isn't to do the investigation. No, so, uh, did you do, you didn't do an, in, you basically relied on what they gave you. Is that fair to say? Relied on the information that- Yeah, just like you did with a warrant. Correct. Okay, so the same people that gave you the warrant application also gave you the, the scope investigation for Mueller. So that's why we're here to find out how much we can trust these people. Now, to appoint a special counsel, there's got to be evidence criminal investigation of a person or matter is warranted. What was the crime that you were looking at? So I think, Senator, it's important to understand, first of all, that's what's required under the regulation. Right. It's actually not required. Uh, to appoint a special counsel that okay. could be a crime. Well, what was, was there a crime being looked at or not? In this particular case, yes. What was the, the crime? The, the original crime, underlying crime, was the Russian uh, uh, influence operation. Okay, can Hacking. you tell us what evidence existed that uh, General Flynn was colluding with the Russians in May of 2017? I, I don't, uh, the evidence against General Flynn, first of all, Senator. What evidence existed that General Flynn was colluding with the Russians in 2017, May of 2017. I, I can't comment about that case, Senator, beyond what's in Did the you know that in January the 4th, 2017, the FBI field office said, we recommend that General Flynn be removed from Crossfire Hurricane? No, I did not. Okay. Would that have mattered if you had known that? Yes. Okay. Did you know that they had recordings of Mr. Papadopoulos somewhere overseas saying, no, I never worked with the Russians, worse to the effect that if the campaign did, that would be treason. Did you know that existed? No, I did not. Okay, did you know that Carter Page, how many times did Carter Page meet with Donald Trump? I don't know the answer to that, Senator. Okay, how many times did Papadopoulos meet with Donald Trump? I don't know the answer to that. Well, I can tell you zero in any meaningful way. The dossier claims that Manaport was, uh, that Carter Page was a kind of Manaport passing along Russian information. Do you, are you aware of the fact that Carter Page has said numerous times, I never talked to Manaport? Yes, I am. Okay. So the point is, when you made this appointment, the people named in it, there's zero evidence they were working with the Russians. Zero. And this went on for two years. $25 million and people had their lives turned upside down that General Flynn, in January the 4th, 2017, the FBI agents who had been looking at him said they recommended he be dropped, and our good old buddy Strzok said, no, the seventh floor wants to look at him. If you had known that, would you have asked more questions? Yes. Okay. 
Anyway, thank you for your service. Knowing what you know now, do you have any reservations about uh, making the Mueller appointment, given the fact that all the people named in this scope letter, there's like zero evidence by January, May 2017, they were working with the Russians. Do you have any concerns at all? I think, Senator, there are two issues. The first is whether the investigation was appropriate, and the second is whether it was appropriate to assign it to Mr. Mueller. And the decision that I made, obviously, was based on the information I had at the time. You need to make I, I'm not arguing with you about assigning it to Mueller. I'm saying, was there a legitimate reason to believe that any of the people named in this letter were actively working with the Russians in August 2017? In August 2017? That's when you signed the memo. My understanding, Senator, was that there, there was what is it? Suspicion. What was it? Based in, and now again, Senator, uh, the, the, the investigation is concluded, and these people were not conspiring with the Russians. Uh, the information available at the time included. Well, why do we have the Mueller investigation at all if we had concluded they weren't working with the Russians? I don't believe we had concluded it at that time. Senator. I'm saying in January the 4th, 2017, the FBI had discounted Flynn. There was no evidence that Carter Page worked with the Russians. The dossier was a bunch of garbage. And Papadopoulos is all over the place, not knowing he's being recorded denying working with the Russians. Nobody's ever been prosecuted for working with the Russians. The point is, the whole concept that the campaign was colluding with the Russians, there was no there there in August 2017. Do you agree with that general statement or not? I agree with that general statement. Thank you. Uh, thanks to General Barr, Brady material relating to Flynn has been released. So too has the Flynn transcript with the Russian ambassador. <clears throat> Those materials include records that show, one, the FBI planned to close the Flynn case until Strzok interceded. Two, that FBI notes that show the FBI may have deliberately set Flynn up to prosecute him or get him fired. Three, the FBI had no derogatory information on Flynn. And four, there was no legitimate factual predicate to interview him. Mr. Rosenstein, you and Mueller withheld these records from Congress and Flynn's legal team. In June of 2018, I met with you to discuss the Flynn case and my other oversight request. You suggested to me that Congress should be satisfied with the facts contained in the plea agreement. In light of all the Brady material that has finally been released, it's clear you were misleading me, Congress, and the American people when you suggested that we should be satisfied with Flynn's plea agreement. Question. Uh, the whole point of the Mueller investigation was to uncover interference <coughs> in the 2016 election. Yet, Mueller ignored the fact that intelligence reports from before he was appointed said the Steele dossier contained Russian disinformation Remember, that's the same dossier that was paid for by the Democrat National Committee and the Clinton campaign. Did you instruct Mueller to investigate the originals, uh, the or origin of the dossier? And if not, why not? Thank you, Senator. First of all, uh, I certainly did not uh, intend to mislead you or anybody else. Uh, and if I could just address that briefly, because I do recall that conversation, Senator, and my view was that uh, the case was pending in court. And there's a longstanding principle of the department that when a case is pending in court, we let the judicial process work through and we don't uh, engage with Congress about pending cases. Uh, and that's the only reason why I was reluctant to disclose information, not that I was concealing anything. I obviously didn't know that there was exculpatory evidence. Uh, and with regard to the evidence that's in the uh, record now because it was filed by the department, I'm not going to express any opinion about that. I'm going to wait and hear what General Barr has to say about it. Uh, uh, but much of that, Senator, was news to me. Uh, with regard to the other question you asked, Senator, um, 
Keep in mind that my goal with regard to the special counsel was to keep that investigation focused and get it resolved as expeditiously as possible. Um, I, I knew that an investigation of the Steele dossier and the origins of the Russia investigation would be far more complicated and take far more time. And uh, I, did, I didn't believe, and I don't believe, think General Barr believes, we need an independent special counsel from outside the department to do that. General Barr is trusting U.S. Attorney Durham uh, to do that, and I think that's a reasonable decision. Uh, so no, I did not ask Director Mueller to do that. And, uh, and I'm actually grateful that we wrapped up the special counsel phase in 22 months. And if there's other information to be uncovered, I'm confident it will be uncovered. Okay. When you approved the fourth and final FISA uh, against Carter Page, were you aware that intelligence reports warned that, uh, warned that the Steele dossier was a product of Russian disinformation? Were you also aware that the Steele's report were not fully verified and that some of Steele's sources supported Clinton? If so, why did you approve the FISA? No, I, I did not. And if I could explain, Senator, I know the time is limited, but uh, the Steele dossier is not in the FISA. It was not submitted to the court. There's information from Steele that's in the application. But my understanding, and again, I reviewed a lot of FISA applications during my tenure, my understanding is that what's in the affidavits is verified. Uh, and so the Steele dossier and all the nonsense that was in the media about uh, you know, these allegations that have been made, um, that, that's not in the FISA application. What's in the FISA application, my understanding was, was verified information. And of course, there is other information. It's not just information that came from Mr. Steele. Let me, let me please get to one final point. My time's just about out. On May the 9th, 2017, you wrote a memo to Attorney General recommending uh, Comey uh, termination. Uh, that same day, the President terminated him. On May the 12th, you sent an email to Mueller that said, quote, the boss and his staff do not know about our discussions, end of quote. On May the 16th, the day before you appointed Mueller, you emailed a former Deputy Attorney General and said, quote, I am with Mueller. He shares my views. Duty calls. Sometimes the moment chooses us, end of quote. What when you referenced the boss, who were you referring to? Uh, and did you discuss appointing Mueller with any Obama administration officials? If so, who? Thank you very much, Senator, for asking that question. You know, as a criminal investigator, we found emails were very useful evidence, but sometimes they can be misleading because they're out of context. And if you allow me the time to explain both of those emails, uh, the first one refers to the fact that I had talked to Director Mueller uh, about the possibility, if I found it necessary to appoint a special counsel, whether he would be available. It was really a, a, a determining whether I had that option. I had not made a decision whether to appoint him. Uh, and Jeff Sessions, as many of you know, is one of the most principled people I've ever met in Washington. He recused from that investigation. His position was, I'm not going to discuss it. I'm recused from the investigation. So uh, what happened there was that General Sessions had reached out independently to Director Mueller to ask him to come in for advice about whether to, uh, about a new FBI director. There are a lot of things going on at the department at that time. One of them was the appointment of a new selection of uh, candidates for a new FBI director. And so that hasty email, which I know some of the media have misconstrued, uh, uh, I was simply alerting Director Mueller, when you talk to the boss, Attorney General Sessions, Keep in mind, he doesn't know anything about the Russia investigation. And uh, uh, it's an example, Senator, of how these things can be misconstrued. It, uh, it's actually a very innocent email. Same thing with the other one, and that's a little bit longer of a story, but it also related to the search for an FBI director. I believe when I sent that email, I was actually in the White House Counsel's office. I was meeting with the Deputy White House Counsel, and we were talking about potential candidates for FBI director, and I had been speaking with the former Deputy Attorney General you have in mind, trying to encourage him to apply for the job. And he was resistant, he was reluctant to apply for the job. Uh, and I was actually lobbying to get him to apply for the job. In fact, I asked Greg Katzis to call one of our former Attorneys General to talk to the former Deputy Attorney General and encourage him to apply. Uh, and uh, I think when I said I'm with Mueller, I meant that literally, that Mueller was with me at the White House. 
Uh, and when I said you need to step up, I meant he needed to step up. I was encouraging him, uh, the former Deputy Attorney General, to step up and apply to be FBI Director. So it's a completely innocent email. I certainly understand out of context how it looks nefarious, but uh, I can assure you, Senator, um, I've been in the department, I had been in the department for 30 years. Those emails are all preserved. Uh, I wouldn't be putting anything nefarious in emails. Hopefully I wouldn't be saying anything nefarious at all, but uh, certainly wouldn't be putting it in email. Senator Cornyn. <laughs> Mr. Rosenstein, I know you've uh, dedicated your, almost your entire adult life to serving at the Department of Justice. And I know you love and revere that institution and the people that work there, and rightly so. But I can only imagine how disappointing it must be to you now to learn, following the revelations of the Inspector General's report and other uh, investigations, uh, some of the facts and circumstances leading up to, um, leading up to the investigation uh, of the Trump campaign. Uh, first of all, let me take you back to Director Comey. You wrote a memo, I believe it was in May of 2017, recommending to President Trump that he fire uh, Director Comey, correct? Uh, my memo to Attorney General Sessions, yes, sir. Be excuse me, you're right. Yeah, it was a memo to the, the Attorney General, and then, then that was forwarded to the President. And your principal concern, as I recall it in that memo, was that Director Comey usurped the role of the Department of Justice when he held a press conference on July 2016, where he said that um, Hillary Clinton uh, was extremely reckless in the way she handled her email server, and but he said that no reasonable prosecutor would prosecute her, and um, thus in the process of saying, well, she's probably not going to get charged with a crime, but nevertheless, let me tell you all about the, all the derogatory information. That was uh, in violation of the norms and the, the re rules and regulations of the Department of Justice, correct? Yes. And you concluded in your memo to Director excuse me, to Tur Attorney General Sessions, that he would probably do that again since he saw nothing wrong with the way he handled that, correct? I don't recall my exact words, Senator, but, uh, but I, I actually I have it in front of me. I think it's about the last sentence or so. It's important that we have an FBI director who recognizes that that was wrong, yes, sir. And so this was an example of the FBI getting involved in a political, in the midst of a presidential political campaign and holding a press conference talking about derogatory information that they discovered, but then saying no reasonable prosecutor would, would prosecute. Can you explain to us why it's important that the Department of Justice, including the FBI, doesn't get involved in the middle of political campaigns? Yes, Senator. I think there are a couple of issues there. One, obviously, is the sensitivity about campaigns. Uh, the other is the principle that the Department of Justice doesn't disparage people. Our prosecutors conduct investigations, and if they determine that they believe the evidence warrants prosecution and it meets the principles of uh, federal prosecution, then they return indictments, and the jury and judge decide about guilt. If we don't indict people, Senator, it's not our job to disparage them. And so that's why uh, I wrote that memo. It's also why I believe uh, it's unfair and unfortunate that that Carter Page FISA was leaked because the principle here, Senator, is we conduct investigations, we presume people innocent, and we don't disparage them unless and until we have evidence that warrants prosecution. Well, given the policy of the Department of Justice not to get, or get involved during political campaigns and to attempt to influence those, it strikes me as unprecedented that in the 2016 timeframe you had open investigations of both candidates running for president, both the Democratic nominee and the Republican nominee. Would you agree with me that there is no precedent for that in American I history? I that's correct. Well, let's talk a little bit about how the FBI handled the uh, investigation in Crossfire Hurricane. We've talked about the Steele dossier, but as you know, at the time uh, Christopher Steele was on the payroll of Fusion GPS to do um, opposition research for the Democratic National Committee on behalf of the Hillary Clinton campaign. He was also retained as a confidential human source by the FBI, correct? 
I don't know uh, all the details, Senator. What I do know, though, is that whoever was paying him is one issue. The other issue is what was the basis for believing he was credible? Did the FBI have an appropriate basis for believing he was credible? And the Inspector General report suggests that, uh, that they misstated that or overstated their basis for believing he was credible. Well, the Inspector General noted that that uh, Steele said, I don't work for the FBI, I work for Fusion GPS. I'm a businessman, but I may pass some information that's useful to the FBI. Do you remember that? I, I, I know that from the report, yes, sir. So at the same time that he was a confidential human source for the FBI, he was on the payroll of Fusion GPS doing opposition research for Hillary Clinton's campaign. He was ultimately terminated by the FBI for violating the rules by leaking the information to the press, but he continued to backdoor information to the FBI through uh, uh, Bruce Orr, correct? Yeah, that's well, my understanding. I don't know the chronology of when he was on the payroll of Fusion GPS, but generally I believe that's correct. And with the chairman's indulgence, let me ask if we can put uh, footnote 350 on, this, on the screen. I asked uh, Attorney General Barr back in uh, May, I think it was, of 2019, I said, can, can we state with any confidence that the Steele dossier was not part of a Russian disinformation campaign? His answer was, well, that's one of the areas that I'm reviewing. I'm concerned about it, and I don't think it's entirely speculative. Well, we know that Bill Priestap, who was in charge of the counterintelligence division, said they did consider the possibility that Steele was a part of a Russian disinformation campaign, but then thanks to the diligence of uh, uh, Senator Grassley and Senator Johnson and the Director of National Intelligence, we now have a copy of the less redacted footnote 350 to the Inspector General report, which points out, if you can see it, that not only did uh, Steele have regular interaction with Russian oligarchs, but that the, there was a potential information, potential for Russian disinformation influencing Steele's election reporting. And it did not have high confidence that the subsources for Steele's reporting and assessed that the reference subset was part of a Russian disinformation campaign to denigrate U.S. foreign relations. So, Mr. Rosenstein. It strikes me that Mr. Putin must be extraordinarily pleased with how this all played itself out. Not only was Hillary Clinton and her campaign disparaged, not only was President Trump and his campaign disparaged and put through what can only be described as hell for the last three and a half years of an investigation when in fact the source of some of the information that was used not only to secure a FISA warrant, but to conduct a counterintelligence investigation may in fact have been part of a Russian disinformation campaign. Does that concern you? It concerns me very much, Senator, and I'm at a bit of a disadvantage. As you know, I was in the job for only two years. I've been gone now for about 13 months, so I don't have access to any information that's been generated through the Durham investigation. I do not know. Uh, what Attorney General Barr has discovered with regard to that. But I think it's important, Senators, for us to keep in mind that uh, it, it, is, it is established, I believe, that uh, Russia's efforts included disparaging Hillary Clinton, as you said. Um, that, that doesn't mean Russia is on the other candidate's side. Russia is on Russia's side. And so I think we should be just as concerned if there's evidence that they were disparaging or attacking or trying to undermine President Trump as we were uh, about their activities with regard to Secretary Clinton. So I, 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 do, I don't I, know the answer to it, but I am concerned about it. I agree with you. you. The, po the point I was trying to make is the Crossfire Hurricane investigation based almost entirely on the allegations of Christopher Steele and the sources he provided, which may have in fact been part of a Russian disinformation campaign, which has successfully divided the country and created a lot of chaos in, in, uh, uh, in the ensuing three and a half years. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Senator, Senator Durbin. If I could just follow up on that, Senator, whether it's Russian disinformation or, or other disinformation, uh, I think the FBI needs to figure out yeah. where did it come from, why was it submitted, uh, and were any crimes committed. I think that's an appropriate area of investigation. I just don't know what the evidence reflects. I believe, and all of us believe, 
that if the Republican Party had paid Mr. Steele through an organization money to dig up dirt on Hillary Clinton, and he used a Russian to create a bunch of garbage that was used to get a warrant against a Clinton campaign operative, you'd have a little different view of this. That you would be raising holy hell, and all your friends in the media would be front page news everywhere. Treason. But it's Trump, it's okay, as long as you're out to get somebody you need to get, damn the way you do it. Well, this committee is not going to accept that standard, my friend. This committee looked at everything you wanted us to look at in terms of Russian behavior. Did Russia interfere? You better believe they did. Will they do it again? Yes, they will. Was this the Ukrainians? No, it was the Russians who stole the emails. It was the Russians who have divided the American people in terms of the 2016 campaign. But it wasn't the Russians, my friend, who withheld information from the FISA court keeping uh, Carter Page's life turned upside down. It wasn't the Russians who refused to tell the court that the underlying dossier that was a crucial to the Carter Page warrant was a bunch of garbage. It wasn't the Russians who manipulated an email to keep getting a warrant against American citizens. It wasn't the Russians who withheld information from the court about General Flynn that they were setting him up and out to get him. It was the Department of Justice. It was the FBI. It was people who hated Trump. If people had a political bias, an agenda to destroy him before he was elected and after he was elected. And we're going to get to the bottom of it. And if you want people subpoenaed, I will certainly listen to what you got to say. But this stinks. This is a sad episode in the history of the FBI. There was no there there in August 2017. And it may not bother you, but it bothers us. And I hope it will bother the American people and we'll fix it. Senator Lee. On June 29th, 2017, you signed off on the third FISA renewal application. Did you read that application? Yes. So you, having been asked to sign off on it, you had read it. Uh, were you aware of the multiple errors and omissions that were later discovered and disclosed by the Inspector General? No. Uh, were you aware that the information provided by Christopher Steele, commonly referred to as the Steele dossier, was the basis of the assertions in the FISA application? I, I believe, Senator, that um, some of the assertions in the application are from Steele, my understanding is, but only some. Were you aware of the fact that the, the Steele dossier, which you've just acknowledged, was at least the partial basis for this, was bought and paid for by the Democratic National Committee and shared with the Hillary Clinton campaign? I don't believe I had that detailed information at the time. Okay, so you, you, you're being asked to do something significant you're asked as the Deputy Attorney General, the Acting Attorney General in this circumstance, to sign off on something. And yet you don't have a critical piece of information. That's a problem. Yes, sir. It seems to me. Uh, it's a problem, especially given that the Foreign Intelligence Surveillance Act can be used, can be manipulated, and in fact has been abused and manipulated to, uh, so as to spy on a presidential campaign. A campaign that uh, turned out to be for the man who became the 45th President of the United States. Were you aware that the application mischaracterized Christopher Steele's past work with the FBI uh, as a confidential human source and failed to include information from his source questioning his reliability. No, I was not aware of that. If you had known about these errors and omissions as of uh, June 29, 2017, would you have signed off on it? No. Why not? Senator, my understanding is that these FISA applications follow a, followed a very rigorous process. And, uh, and that they were accurate, that they were verified. The whole principle of having an agent sign it under oath is that you can rely on the facts. And the whole point of having the Deputy Attorney General sign off on them was to have somebody who would be accountable to someone who was in turn accountable to the voters who could verify their accuracy. Is that right? And yet that did not happen. I don't think that the idea is for the person who, the, the person who approves the filing, which is the Attorney General, the Deputy, or the National Security Assistant Attorney General, to personally verify the facts. It's to make sure the accurate process has been followed and that the document sets forth a, a proper basis. Sure. It did set forth a But proper surely basis. the process isn't an ask. The, the process isn't there simply to provide cover, to exactly. do something unlawful. The process is there, ideally, one would hope, to make sure the rule of law is respected. Correct. Before you became the, uh, the acting attorney general in, in, in this context, 
didn't you at, at, at some point get a sense for the politicization uh, within the FBI, at the top level of the FBI, even beyond Jim Comey? No. You didn't have any sense that there was a targeting of a presidential candidate uh, uh, and, and uh, later someone who became the president of the United States? I did not have that impression. <clears throat> what was the legal basis for appointing Robert Mueller? Um, and, and didn't you become concerned at some point about the composition of Mueller's staff. Let's take, for example, uh, Mr. Weissman. Mr. Weissman is now fundraising for Joe Biden, as is his right. Uh, previously, he, he was an advocate of the Hillary Clinton campaign. Uh, did that bother you, that you had known Democratic operatives, overwhelmingly Democratic-leaning people who were part of this team? It would have been preferable, Senator, to have a, a more politically diverse group. But if they follow the rules, their political ideology wouldn't matter. <clears throat> If, if, if everyone followed the rules, political ideologies wouldn't matter. And well, but the, Senator, I had Bob Mueller in charge of this, and, and uh, based upon that and based upon my conversations with him, uh, I'm fairly confident that the political bias did not enter into that investigation. At any point, were you asked by any member of Congress to launch a criminal investigation of President Trump? I don't believe so. <clears throat> Getting back to the, the FISA application process, why didn't you urge the Foreign Intelligence Surveillance Court to appoint an amicus curiae, given the obvious sensitivities of this investigation? Well, Senator, I have to tell you in context, you asked me about reading the, the FISA. Um, there, there are a lot of FISA applications that come through. Some are more significant than others. This one was unusual in that I already knew about it because of the Russia investigation. Most of the FISA applications that are presented to me, I'm the last eyes on them before they're filed to the court, and I know nothing about them. This one I actually knew a fair amount about, and they gave it to me in advance so I could review it. I'm not sure I read every page, but I was familiar with what was in it. Um, but I, I, it actually, if you read the report, and I know you, most people haven't seen the unredacted version, but my recollection of it, I haven't seen it for some time, is it was actually fairly persuasive. Uh, and so, and it had already been approved three times. This was just a reauthorization. I, uh, thank you. Now, you, you indicated moments ago that Mr. McCabe did not lie to you. Uh, but you also acknowledged that he was not fully candid. What's the, what's the difference? Well, you know, lying is when you ask somebody a direct question, you get a, 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 a false answer. Candor is when you're forthcoming with information that, that somebody needs to know. And I believe, Senator, that uh, Mr. McCabe should have recognized that when I became acting attorney general, I needed to know about Mr. Comey's memos. Uh -oh. He needed to understand that, and he did not tell that to me until a couple of hours before they showed up in the New York Times. What, so what and when did he tell you about the Comey memos? And when should he have done that? And also, did, uh, didn't he, he, he waited for at least a week before telling you about some of the, the intel-related concerns? Uh, weren't you his boss? Correct. And so he had an obligation to tell you. And well, yet I don't know if he had a legal obligation, Senator, but uh, you know, my philosophy as a manager was that you have a responsibility to tell the boss things that uh, you, you know they need to know. Right. And that's a pretty important thing that I would have needed to know. And, and so that would have been regarded as material. The omission of that, had you been aware of it, probably would have been grounds for termination. If I had asked him and he had misrepresented it, yes. <clears throat> Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I see my time has expired. Uh, Senator Cruz. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Prior to 2016 and 2017, the worst known instance of abuse of power by an administration was Richard Nixon's abuse of his administration to target his political enemies. By any measure, what the Obama-Biden administration did in 2016 and 2017 makes everything Richard Nixon even contemplated pale in comparison. And Richard Nixon rightfully faced impeachment and ultimately resigned as a consequence of his misconduct. The evidence that has been made public has made clear that the Obama administration targeted his political opponents, targeted President Trump and his campaign, unleashed weaponized and politicized the Department of Justice, the FBI, and the intelligence community, and that the decision-making to do so went right up to the very top. We know that on January 4th, 2017, the FBI concluded in a document that has just been released that, there, that 
General Michael Flynn was, quote, no longer a viable candidate to be part of this larger case. Their investigation did not yield any information on which to predicate further investigative efforts. The FBI is closing this investigation. That was January 4th, 2017. The next day, James Comey, the director of the FBI, is sitting in the Oval Office with Barack Obama, with Joe Biden, and James Comey, according to a memo from Susan Rice, one of the most remarkable CYA memos written in Washington, written on her last day in office, an email to herself saying, by the way, this investigation into the National Security Advisor coming in to the new office, the president has said, do it, quote, by the book. She says, by the book, three times. James Comey tells the president, we're investigating Michael Flynn by the book. Well, unless the book is Richard Nixon's Watergate, the day before the FBI said they were closing the investigation, and there's James Comey telling Barack Obama we're going after General Flynn, a decorated three-star general, the incoming national security advisor of the president, with Joe Biden sitting right there nodding along. Joe Biden himself personally unmasks Michael Flynn's name. That's the world you came into, Mr. Rosenstein. That's the Department of Justice you came into, where it had been corrupted and politicized. You've read the Inspector General report, Mr. Rosenstein? I, I've read most of it, yes, sir. You've read the 17 repeated material misstatements documented within the Inspector General report. I have read that, yes, sir. You're aware one of those is a lawyer fraudulently altering an email, creating counterfeit evidence that became the predicate for a sworn statement in the FISA court. That is in the Inspector General's report, yes, sir. Are you aware of other instances of Department of Justice employees fraudulently creating evidence to submit to court? Every instance that I'm aware of, Senator, would be appropriately investigated and, and hopefully uh, appropriate action would be taken. Mr. Rosenstein, on May 17th, you appointed Bob Mueller the special counsel. On June 29th, you signed the third FISA application. On August 2nd, you signed the second <clears throat> scope application. You came into a profoundly politicized world, and yet all of this was allowed to go forward under your leadership. That unfortunately leads to only two possible conclusions. Either that you were complicit in the wrongdoing, which I don't believe was the case, or that your performance of your duties was grossly negligent. Was there, any, that standard, Senator. <laughs> was there any more important case the Department of Justice had than an investigation into whether the President of the United States is a Russian asset colluding against the United States? Well, that's the way you're characterizing the investigation, Senator. There was certainly Lots of important investigations, but I view this as one of the most important. Okay. You just told Senator Lee you read the FISA application. At the time you read the FISA application, did you know that the primary source behind the Steele dossier had disavowed it and said it's not true? At the time I reviewed it, and I'm not sure I read every word, but I certainly reviewed it, and no, I did not know that. At the time you reviewed it, did you know that there was significant exculpatory material that was omitted from it? Absolutely not. At the time you reviewed it, did you know that a lawyer on your staff had fraudulently altered material as a basis for a FISA application? That lawyer was not on my staff, but I was not aware of it. It was on the FBI staff? Correct. And the FBI reports to the Deputy Attorney General? Correct. At the time that you reviewed it, did you know the Steele dossier was paid, by the DNC, paid for by the DNC? I don't believe so. Did you ask any of those questions? Well, I... The questions I would have asked, Senator, would have been, is the information represented to me verified? And I would anticipate, Senator, that if uh, somebody knew that it wasn't, or that there was some issue about the credibility of the informant or the accuracy of the evidence that Mrs. Was Ro Mr. Senator. Rosenstein, when you're going into a, a department that has been politicized, I understand it's easier just not to rock the boat, not to question the people there. But you were the acting attorney general of the United States and had a responsibility 
not to allow political targeting. Uh, let me ask you, did it strike you as strange? And my time has expired, so I'm going to leave this as the last question. Did it strike you as strange that the FBI and the Department of Justice was going after a three-star general, the incoming national security advisor to the president, who they already said they were going to dismiss the case against, and their predicate for all of this was, is the Logan Act, which you know perfectly well is an unconstitutional law that has never been, no one has ever been prosecuted under in the history of the Department of Justice, and should have been laughed out of the room in any responsible Department of Justice if someone had suggested, we're going to go after the incoming national security advisor for violating the Logan Act, which says an American citizen can't talk to a foreign leader, I guarantee you today, right now, John Kerry is violating the Logan Act. Now, fortunately, it's an unconstitutional law, so who cares? <laughs> why did you not laugh this out of the room, and why didn't you get to answers on this? Why did you let this pile of partisan lies consume the country for two years. Senator, I appreciate uh, you, you packed a lot into your question, and I know the time is limited. Uh, first of all, Senator, uh, I, I think it's not accurate to say that we didn't rock the boat. Uh, as you may be aware, when I went into that job with Attorney General Sessions, we actually made a lot of significant changes. It wasn't just about the Russian investigation. There was a lot more going on in the Department of Justice. Uh, and so I would not have been reluctant in any way to rock the boat if I believed that there was something improper going on. Uh, with regard to General Flynn, to take that particular issue, Senator, my understanding at the time that I arrived was that General Flynn had lied to the Vice President and to FBI agents, and that, I believe, was the primary issue that was uh, under investigation at the time. I didn't know all the background that appears in the pleading that was filed by the U.S. Attorney in D.C. But, but you didn't bother to ask. You didn't actually bother to drill in and say, show me the background. You know, this may be the most important case we've got in the whole country. Let me actually do more than just rubber stamp the document put in front of me. Uh, I don't believe I was rubber stamping, Senator, and I fully appreciate your concern. And obviously, you always wish you could have done more. But uh, we did have 70,000 cases filed that year. I devoted more attention to this case than to anything else, but I still didn't know everything. Uh, and so that's the best I can give you, Senator. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I just want to start by, by noting my surprise to hear from my Democrat colleagues that the Mueller report is now of no consequence. After what they put this country through for years on end, endless investigations, millions of dollars spent, an impeachment inquiry against the President of the United States, and now we hear from person after person on that side of the dais that the Mueller report is of no consequence. No consequence? I kind of happen to think that the successful weaponization of the FBI by a presidential campaign, by the Hillary Clinton presidential campaign, for the first time in American history, getting the FBI to submit to a federal court false information, false information, to get a wiretap during a presidential campaign, I kind of think that that is a relevant piece of information that maybe ought to be within the jurisdiction and the cognition of this committee. Of course now my Democrat friends say there's nothing to see here because now we have one of the largest scandals ever to engulf the FBI and the DOJ. Let me just remind you, Mr. Rosenstein, about what the FISA court said when it found out that it had been systematically lied to by the FBI and the Department of Justice. This is what the court said, sua sponte, on its own, and I quote, the FBI's handling of the Carter Page applications, as portrayed in the Inspector General's report, was antithetical to the heightened duty of candor that is owed to the court. The frequency with which these representations made by FBI personnel turned out to be unsupported or contradicted by information in their possession and with which they withheld information detrimental to their case calls into question whether information contained in other FBI applications is reliable, end quote. In other words, the FISA court now wonders if it can trust anything that the FBI says. Anything. Now, you signed off on a FISA application to a federal court in an ex parte proceeding, which means the other side didn't have any chance to argue it, you signed off on it. It had 17 material misstatements, falsehoods, omissions 
You signed off on it. You also said at the time you thought it was an above average application. Correct. How could you sign off on something with this number of misrepresentations that the FISA court later came back and said, this, this destroys our trust in the FBI? You signed off on it personally. How could this happen? I, I approved the submission of it, and, and four federal judges signed off on it too, Senator, because, like me, they believed that the information had been verified and was accurate. Did they have a duty to verify the information? No, the agents had a duty to did, verify. Oh, so you did not have a duty to verify the information? I had a duty. Your name on the application. Well, I had a duty to make sure it had been verified. Did you rubber stamp it? Senator, the, the Deputy Attorney General or the Attorney General. Just answer my question. Did you rubber no, stamp it? You said a second ago to Senator Cruz, you no, said I didn't, I didn't rubber stamp it. If you'd like me to explain, I will. But I certainly. But you also testified to today that you didn't read it. So I'm curious. No, I didn't say How is it? You, you, would you like us to have your testimony read back to you? You said, I can't say that I read it. I don't think I read every page. I mean. Yes, I did say that. Yes. But, okay, uh, so you didn't rubber stamp it, but you didn't read it. You, you know, Senator, I have to explain the process. Um, oh, I think we're familiar with the process. No, the OIG I, gave us the process. By the time it got to you, you had 17 critical errors, falsehoods, omissions, leading a federal court to say they have never seen anything like this and they can't trust anything else the FBI says and you signed off on it. How, who, let me ask you this. Who are we to hold responsible? Yes. You're saying it's not you. No, no, I'm, I'm saying, Senator, that I am accountable for it. But the question is, why did it happen? Now, I'm no longer in the department, but there are people who are there who I expect will figure out why it happened and will fix the problem. So I'm not trying to deny Do you have any theories government. about what the problem might be? I, I only know what the Inspector General's report reflects, Senator. Uh, and again, I've been gone for 13 months, so I have no insight. Well, wouldn't you agree with me that a process that is so corrupted that it resulted in the abuse of a federal court in an ex parte proceeding during a presidential campaign is a threat to American democracy? Is a threat to the integrity of our elections? Would you agree with that? It, it's, a, it's certainly a threat to the integrity of the uh, judicial system and the FISA process, but. I need to explain to you, Senator, that uh, you know when you're running an organization with 115,000 people, you're not going to be able to personally verify the information. No, I know. So, I, and that's why you can't be held responsible. No, no, I am the FBI responsible. says they can't be I held responsible. responsible. And so at the end of the day, it's nobody's fault. No, no, the no. FISA court has been misled. The FISA court is saying we can't trust anything. The FBI says, but nobody's to blame for it. So let me just ask you, who should we hold responsible? What, what do you want this committee to do? The other side wants us to do nothing. They don't want to talk about it. They're happy for these abuses to go on, apparently. What do you suggest that we do? I think, Senator, there, there are issues of accountability and blame. I'm accountable. I'm here being chastised by you, and that's part of my accountability. But the question is blame. What went wrong? And we need to figure out what went wrong. And I think it, when you say I signed off on it, it, it suggests that my responsibility was to actually do the investigation and verify the information. That, that's just not the responsibility of the deputy. The responsibility is to make sure we've got an accurate process in place that guarantees the integrity of the applications. And but that, but that out, process wasn't in place. It turned out that it wasn't. Exactly. And so if I'm at fault because I had a reason to know that or should have known that, I should be blamed for that. But I just don't know. I didn't see that in the IG report. I didn't see him blaming me or my predecessors. Uh, and, uh, and that's all I know about it, Senator. So I certainly am accountable for it. But in order to solve this problem, yelling at me is not going to solve the problem. We need to figure out what happened. Did people engage in misconduct? Are there systemic problems? And fix them so it won't happen again. Yeah, of course. Well, uh, thank you, Mr. Rosenstein, for your service, and, and we'll certainly, I'm sure this committee will take every pain not to hold you accountable or responsible. Apparently, we can't I hold am anybody accountable. accountable or responsible, Mr. Chairman. Thank so you. I don't know what this committee has left to do, but I do know this. What has happened is unacceptable. And we've I heard agree. the FBI director sit in the seat that you're in, Mr. Rosenstein, and say he's not accountable. He says he's not making any changes. In fact, he's done nothing, the current FBI director, to address this situation. Nobody seems to want to do anything. Meanwhile, we're in another presidential election year. I look forward to hearing about how the FBI has weaponized the FISA court again in this election year. Who knows? We'll be hearing about that in two or three years from now. This circumstance is simply not acceptable, Mr. Chairman, and that's why I'm glad we're doing this, but we've got to hold somebody accountable for it. Senator, as I said, uh, I agree with you that... Uh, I'm sorry. Mr. Chairman, if I could just finish the answer that, uh, again, there are questions of accountability and questions of blame, and it is the responsibility of Director Ray to solve these problems. And, and I, I don't know, uh, I'm not familiar with the hearing well, that you may reference, let, let to, me but just, I certainly hope that yeah. he solve these so problems. So here's what's happening. Uh, we have recommendations from Horowitz how to make sure this doesn't have it happen again. 
We've got Mr. Durham looking at criminality. And it's up to this committee to come up with a process, hopefully bipartisan, where we can make sure this doesn't happen again. The FBI was told in January the dossier was not reliable. Hearsay, bar talk by the primary subsource gave Mr. Steele all the information. And the warrant was renewed on two occasions after that in April and June. He says he didn't know about the exculpatory information being withheld. I think it's okay to ask everybody who signed the warrant, did you know? Is this really one FBI agent in the bottom of the basement somewhere who did all this by themselves? I don't think so. Senator Tillis. Thank you, Mr. Thank you. I may have the same problem as. <laughs> yep. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. The, uh, I appreciate you holding this hearing. It's remarkable to me that people uh, on the other side of the dais here thinks that this is a waste of time. I think that this is a very important part of oversight and preservation of uh, integrity of our our justice system. Uh, I, I, by the way, uh, Senator Durbin's not here. I love baseball too. And the reruns are pretty good. As a matter of fact, I got emotional watching the sixth game of a series with Atlanta until I realized that it was about 20 years ago. But the, the, the league here in the Senate's working. Uh, Senator Durbin's comments would suggest we're not doing anything else. This is one hearing of several hearings we're doing this week. I would remind everybody we had a hearing making sure that we're doing the very best we can for our prison population on COVID-19 response just yesterday. I would also talk about hearings on implementing the CARES Act and the Banking Committee. Happened this week. That was another game that got played yesterday. I would also talk about a number of other hearings that are specifically focused on doing everything that we can to keep running. I, for one, think that, uh, that although our leader McConnell has been criticized for us being here, it's remarkable to me, on the one hand, we have people saying, shame on you for being here, and on the other hand, saying, shame on you for not doing anything else. We're doing a hell of a lot here, and a lot of it's focused on the COVID response, but the integrity of the Department of Justice and the FBI, I think, is probably worthy of having a discussion over. That's the discussion we're having here. I also heard some of my colleagues on the other side of the aisle speak dismissively with the idea of a hoax or a witch hunt. Well, I decided to go on the Oxford Online, so I had a, a reasonable source. And uh, hoax is described as a malicious deception. A lot of what we're talking about here are malicious deceptions or omissions. Let's, let's remove deception and omission. The omission of a truth in some, uh, some of the online dictionaries is actually tantamount to a lie. A witch hunt is described as a campaign directed against a person or a group holding unpopular views. Well, we've seen the email transmissions by some of the people who were responsible for the FISA warrants. Looks like to me they had a different political view. Viva la res resistance. So I actually believe that hoax and witch hunt may be contextually accurate to describe some of the things that went on with this Mueller investigation. And let me tell you, this is pretty personal to me because, uh, Mr. Rosenstein, you may remember that I went on a bill with my colleague across the aisle to make sure that we were able to keep Mueller in place and to continue the investigation. I did that premised on the assumption that I could trust the people that were doing the damn investigation. And now I know I couldn't. I still stand by the, the, uh, the, the fundamental position that I took, but I'm a little bit angry with what's happened here. And Mr. Rosenstein, in your opening comments, you mentioned that you had three hand-picked teams, three hand-picked teams that were working on this investigation. And based on my research, I believe that Page, Strzok, and Kleinsmith were on one or all of those teams. Now, I also believe that by virtue of them not providing information to you, that they're guilty of a hoax. They're guilty of a malicious deception, information that they had access to. Now, a hand-picked team Mr. Rosenstein, would you say that's, uh, you're, you're trying to pick some of the better players? You're taking people off the bench that you consider to be some of the better ones in the department? I, I would hope that that's what they yeah. did. So do you think that these people would have had enough training and experience to know that withholding that information to their boss was probably something that was a bad idea? 
I mean, does, it, does this rise to a level where we can say, ah, oh, struck, page, clients, it was just an oversight. The damning information we found in the Horowitz report, can we honestly believe that these highly trained people could have just said, gosh, boss, I, I forgot about that material fact when I gave you information for something for you to sign? Senator, I do not know that it was struck Page and Kleinsmith. I don't believe those allegations are in the IG report, but whoever it is, I think should be held accountable. I do too. And I think it goes far beyond disciplinary action. Um, the, uh, the other thing that you said was with respect to McCabe, and you said he was not completely forthcoming. And, and I think you may have alluded in, in an answer to one of the questions asked by my colleagues, uh, that at least ethically, maybe he had information that would have been helpful for you to have. That sounds like a deception to me, too. That sounds like the omission of information. This is a smart man, a very capable, well-educated, experienced person. Why on earth would something like that, with all the attention being placed on it, could any reasonable person think other than the fact that it was omitted because it could have materially affected your view of what had gone before? Senator, I don't want to speculate about what uh, was in anybody else's state of mind. Well, I will. And I think it was because they were trying to move towards a, 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 an outcome that fit what some people in the lower levels of the organization had in mind. You can't read the emails between some of these people. You can't look at some of the, I'm not an attorney, I'm not a solicitor general, I'm not a prosecutor, but it doesn't take a law degree to recognize that these were basic, these were not mistakes. These were intentional actions and it's why this hearing it's why the subpoenas and why this investigation needs to go forward. Because to your point in your opening statement, the vast majority of the people in law enforcement, the vast majority of people in the DOJ and the FBI have been disgraced as a result of the, at worst, incompetent actions and at, at best and at worst, the malicious actions of a handful of a few and we have to get to the bottom of it. So Mr. Rosenstein, you were confirmed as the DAG. Uh, in April of 2017. And we know that you had direct contact with at least one of those FISA applications while serving in that position. And I'm, I'm sure that you've dealt with many others. But speaking generally on the topic of FISA surveillance, do you typically want the subject to know that you're conducting an investigation on them? Absolutely not, for a number of reasons. Can you expound? Yes. Why not? Well, number one, it, the whole principle is it's a covert investigation. Uh, you know, if the suspects know you're looking at them, obviously they're much less likely to uh, engage in open communications that would allow you to discover what they're up to, number one. And number two, which uh, is a point that I emphasize, Senator, throughout my career, the people we investigate are presumed innocent, and we have a responsibility uh, not to damage them by the investigation. The investigation is not supposed to be the punishment. Uh, and so it's very important not to disclose those investigations. Very good. But on, on June 29th, 2017, you were briefed on and signed then that third FISA renewal application regarding Carter Page, extending the FISA surveillance of Page until September of 2017. And at that point at which the third FISA renewal application came to your desk for your signature, the news about the surveillance had already been leaked to the media, is that correct? Correct. So at that point, Carter Page knows that he's being sur surveilled, he's being investigated, but the FBI wants to continue conducting surveillance on him. Why, why did they want to do that? Because they believed that uh, the uh, extension w w might generate relevant evidence. Uh, the fact that he, it had already been publicly known obviously is a factor you would expect to consider. Uh, but my understanding was that notwithstanding that, they still believed that the application uh, uh, met the standard for generating relevant evidence, Senator. But uh, I think that's a very insightful and valid question. Yeah, it is a very valid question. And so why did, uh, why did it happen then? Uh, did you raise any questions about that when you were briefed on that third application? Yes. And it's what actually, was that conversation? It's the fourth application, so it's uh, the third extension, I Third suppose. extension, uh, thank you. But uh, yes, and uh, I was told that they had considered that and they believed that it warranted one more extension. My understanding was it would be, and in fact was, the last extension. 
but it's based on you know, the legal standard actually requires the affidavit to set forth new information, and there is new information in the third application, third, pardon me, uh, renewal, fourth application, uh, that appeared to justify extending it. Well, to just, again, an average person, not a lawyer, um, I would say that the, the reason to continue surveillance um, on someone that, that already knows they're being watched is uh, truly as a political tool. It's political interference. And I think that's why so many of us are so disappointed in, in the FBI, in DOJ, and we have to see those corrections. So again, I am thankful that we are having this hearing. I think it is very pertinent that we address this now as we're involved in another presidential cycle. Um, we really do have to find and hold accountable those people that committed uh, these crimes, what I see as crimes. So thank you very much, thank you. Uh, Mr. Mr. Chair. Chairman, if I could just uh, respond to one or two brief points, actually. Number one, uh, with regard to the political interference uh, suggestion, it was my understanding at the time, Senator, that Mr. Page, at least in June of 2017, hadn't been involved in the campaign, wasn't uh, working in the administration. So I did not view that as, as targeting any kind of political information. I understand the question. Uh, and I think we're in a different context, obviously, in June than we were in September. But um, uh, Inspector General Horowitz's report, I think, uh, accurately reflects that the application itself appeared to state a proper lawful basis. And obviously, I wouldn't have approved it if I believed it was targeted at getting campaign information. And the second issue I really appreciate your raising because I, I grew up with those television shows, too. It's one of the reasons I spent 30 years in law enforcement. And uh, since I'm here and under oath, Senator, I think it's worth taking the opportunity to tell you that uh, I have worked with many, many federal agents uh, over the course of my 30-year career, many attorneys in the Department of Justice. Uh, and I want to reassure you, Senator, that uh, some of the finest people that I know are employees of the FBI and the Department of Justice. So uh, while these are serious problems, they need to be fixed. Uh, I want you to know that that confidence that you have in the men and women of the FBI is justified. Thank you. Thank you. Senator Hirono, who will be joining us telephonically, is up next. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. We're in the middle of a pandemic. We've now crossed the grim milestone of more than 100,000 people having died from COVID-19. Our country is in turmoil because last week, Minneapolis, Minneapolis police officers openly murdered George Floyd in full public view. And what was the crime that he allegedly committed that led Officer Derek Chauvin to shove his knee into Mr. Floyd's neck for more than eight minutes, a claim that a $20 bill he used was fake. The marks of injustice in this case are painful, traumatic, and unbearable, but sadly not isolated in our country, as we have seen too many times in the past few weeks alone. Racism in our country is clear and longstanding. In the midst of all this turmoil, this committee is having a hearing on something that we have already covered exhaustively, that has already been covered exhaustively by the Justice Department's Inspector General in a nearly 500 page report where they interviewed 100 witnesses, reviewed a million documents, and found no documentary or testimonial evidence that political bias or improper motivations influenced the FBI's investigation. Moreover, the investigation was open for an authorized purpose under proper factual predicate. In fact, we know that uh, Christopher Ray, our FBI director, has already implemented some 40 corrective steps based on the Inspector General's report. So this hearing wastes this committee's time in a blatant effort to support the president's conspira conspiracy theories and to help the president's re-election. How can these aims be proper use of this committee's time? Mr. Horowitz, no, <laughs> that was the inspector general. Mr. Rosenstein, in September, 2018, the New York Times reported that you had suggested wearing a wire to secretly record President Trump after he fired 
FBI Director Comey and link the firing to the Russian investigation. The article also reported that you discussed recruiting cabinet members to invoke the 25th Amendment to remove Mr. Trump from office. On April 26, 2019, the Washington Post reported that after the New York Times report, you were in danger of losing your job. According to the Post, when President Trump called you for an explanation, you tried to assure the president you were on his team. When discussing Special Counsel Mueller's investigation, you reportedly said, quote, I give the investigation credibility, end quote, and, quote, I can lend the plane. Mr. Rosenstein, did you tell the president I can land the plane regarding Special Counsel Mueller's investigation? You packed a lot into that question, <laughs> Senator, and uh, I, I, I hope you allow me to answer. Number one, the idea that I was involved in some conspiracy to get the president is ridiculous, and I think that uh, I worked for two years with... Well, you know what? You can respond to my specific questions regarding the wearing of the wire, but this first question is, did you tell the president I can land the plane? I do not believe I've ever used those words, I can land the plane, Senator, and I have not ever talked about my personal communications with the President, but what I can tell you is what I always said when anyone asked me about the investigation, which was that we would complete it okay. appropriately and expeditiously, and I made no inappropriate commitments. Let me ask you the question about, uh, did you suggest or hint at secretly recording President Trump? I did not suggest yes or, no? or hint at secretly recording President Trump. I, uh, have you have you ever discussed with anyone the possibility of invoking the 25th Amendment to remove this president from office? I have never uh, in any way suggested that the president should be removed from office under the 25th Amendment. And I can give you a more detailed explanation if you have time. We all know that, uh, that Attorney General Barr made certain uh, characterizations of the Mueller report, which... <laughs> Uh, I would say we're not accurate, but he did say in a letter that he wrote to Congress, he said, Deputy Attorney General Rob Rosenstein and I have concluded that the evidence developed during the special counsel's investigation is not sufficient to establish that the president committed an obstruction of justice offense. Did Attorney General Barr accurately present your view regarding the obstruction of uh, justice? Senator, I do not believe that the evidence collected by the special counsel warrants prosecution of the president. That is correct. Oh, that's not, that was not my question. It has nothing to do with whether collusion was found. We also know that, the, that President Trump did not cooperate fully with Mueller's investigation on that point. No, he did note a number of obstruction of justice actions by this president. So... Did you agree with uh, Barr's letter that you agree that there was no um, obstruction of justice involved? I, I'm sorry, Senator, that's what I tried to answer the first time. The answer is, yes, I do not believe that the president committed a crime that warrants prosecution. And that's the issue that we review as prosecutors. No, uh, excuse me. They said, the Mueller report said that they did not find enough evidence to, to go after the president for collusion. And we all know that the Office of Legal Counsel said that the president, a sitting president cannot be indicted, but they did raise a number of obstruction of justice actions by the president and left open the issue of whether or not that would be indictable. But we all know that uh, the Office of Legal Counsel said you can't indict a sitting president. And by the way, more than 1,000 formal former federal prosecutors who served under both Republican and Democratic administrations disagreed with you regarding the obstruction of justice issue. And they wrote that baby the President Trump's conduct described in Special Counsel Mueller's report would, quote, result in multiple felony charges for obstruction of justice, end quote. They emphasize that these are not matters of professional judgment they further noted that to look at these facts and say that a prosecutor could not probably sustain a conviction for obstruction of justice runs counter to logic and experience. So can you explain why you are right and more than 1,000 former DOJ prosecutors are wrong on the issue of obstruction of justice by this president? Well, Senator, we have a lot more than 1,000 former DOJ prosecutors. And I don't know whether all those people read the entire report 
or were familiar with all the evidence, but, uh, but I was, and I believe Attorney General Barr has already explained his conclusion. And Senator, I think it's very important when we complete investigations, we reach conclusions, and the department either determines a case merits prosecution or it does not, and we determine that that case does not merit prosecution. Now, people are free to express contrary opinions, and because the I think I have to public, repeat myself again. I've read the Mueller report. They did not say that uh, there was not enough evidence with regard to obstruction of justice. No. They noted, and I disagree with Mueller. I don't know why he didn't come to the conclusion that there, no. are, there was actually enough evidence on the obstruction of no. justice issue, Senator, but that they could not, Senator, they could not no. indict the president. That no. part Thank is really clear. You. Thank you. Thank you I think, very Senator, much. Thank you. if I may Thank explain, you. No, Chairman, that's good. That's I think that's good. unfair, Senator, because the, uh, the investigation was concluded. It was appropriately reviewed. No one recommended in favor of prosecution. The Attorney General and I determined the prosecution was not warranted, and that is I think conclusion. that question has been asked and answered. I appreciate it very much. Uh, Senator Cravo. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And Mr. Rosenstein, I just want to, Rosenstein, I want to clear up a few issues here. Uh, first of all, uh, once again, we've heard here from uh, some in the committee that Inspector Horowitz's report, uh, which you've read and discussed with us today, uh, found that there was no evidence of bias in the activities of the FBI in the, in the uh, Crossfire Hurricane investigation. Um, I think that's clearly not what he found. But first let me establish this. In the report itself, the Inspector General found that the Crossfire Hurricane team's receipt of the Steele election reporting on September two, in September 2016 played a central and essential role in the FBI's and the department's decision to seek the FISA order. Do you agree with that? I, I'm aware of what was in the FISA application, and I understand that uh, people who were more directly involved, like Mr. McCabe, have testified about that, so uh, I didn't know everything that they knew, but that's my understanding. All right, thank you. Now, with regard to this question of whether there is bias, this is one of the main reasons we're here in this hearing today as to what happened and why the problems that arose came up. The Inspector General, as we all know, found 17 significant violations of process and procedure that resulted in uh, you stating here earlier today that had you known them, you would not have signed the, the FISA request. Correct. Uh, in that context, he did indicate, as I read it, that he found bias, but that he could not prove that the bias was a cause of the decisions that were made. Do you agree with that? Yes, sir. I think that's the way I would characterize it, that he, he, it's not that he didn't find bias, it's that he didn't find evidence that the bias affected the outcome. In fact, the phrase that he used, and which is now very common, is that, there, that he could not find documentary or testimonial evidence that the bias caused the decisions made by the team, correct? I don't recall the exact words, but I, I accept that. I, I asked uh, the inspector about that when he was here testifying before us about his report, and he basically confirmed that, and, and I, saw, I, I concluded it with him saying, so how did you try to find out if it bled into the decision making, if the bias did? And he said, I had you know, I asked those who had the bias, and I asked those who were making the decisions, and they said no, they didn't, you know, they didn't let bias cause their decision making. And because I could not find documentary or testimonial evidence otherwise, I concluded I couldn't prove that there was bias in the final decision making. That's how I read it. At that point, I said to him that I found it inexplicable. Um, actually, I think he used that word. I found it mind-numbing, I think is what I said to him, that you could not see the bias bleeding into the decision-making. And he responded to me by saying, I said, how could you not reach that conclusion? Basically, he said, there is such a range of conduct here that it is inexplicable. And the answers we got were not satisfactory, that we are left trying to understand how could all these errors have occurred over a nine-month period of time or so among three teams, handpicked one of the highest profile, if not the highest profile case in the FBI, going to the very top of the organization involving a presidential campaign. So he said, he, I think he was saying he thought it was inexplicable. I said to him, 
I understand that. I think it is explicable. I think it was bias. My question to you is, what do you think? Yeah, I think it's a very important issue, Senator. I think the important thing to keep in mind, and again, I have the experience of three decades in law enforcement, um, our goal is for the Department of Justice to be nonpartisan in its operations. Our people are not nonpartisan, though. We have people with very strong political views on both sides. I have my own political views. Obviously, the attorney generals always have political views, and our line employees do, too. The goal is to train them about the way they go about their work, to exclude political partisan considerations from their decision making. So what was concerning about the information the inspector general turned up was that it wasn't that our employees had political views, it was that their political views uh, appeared to be influencing uh, their uh, conduct of the investigation, at least based on what their messages suggested. Now, the inspector general completed his investigation uh, and uh, he reached his conclusion, but my goal, Senators, number one, is to avoid actual political influence. Number two is to avoid the appearance of political influence, uh, which is very difficult. So I encourage you to keep in mind we don't require our employees to have no views. We just encourage them to set their views aside when they're doing their work. I understand that, and I understand the difference between the appearance of political influence and the reality of it. And my question goes to the fact that when you've got, as, as the Inspector General said, when you have all of these errors, 17 significant errors, one including a criminal act of changing a document, occurring over a nine-month period of time among three teams handpicked on one of the most high-profile cases in the country. Isn't there a point at which you must say that there's a real possibility that this appearance is real? Well, it's an appearance that the work was not done properly whether it was a result of bias or negligence or failed policies, I think that's something that General Barr needs to address, and I believe he will. Well, you indicated that the outcome of the special counsel's investigation was that we found that Russians did commit crimes seeking to influence our election and that Americans did not conspire correct. with them. That's correct. Yes, sir. And then I'll just conclude with this. Uh, I'm going right back to your introductory comments, and that is... Uh, as you concluded your testimony, you indicated that the Inspector General concluded that so many basic and fundamental errors were made by three separate hand-picked teams um, on one of the mo FBI's most sensitive investigations that FBI officials expected would be subjected to close scrutiny raised significant questions regarding the FBI chain of command, management, and supervision of the, of the FISA process. You still stand by that? Yes, sir. I always emphasize to uh, my subordinates that it's very important for us to follow the rules because if we don't follow the rules, people are going to question our motivations. Uh, and so it's certainly understandable that you would be concerned about that. And my hope is that uh, the Attorney General will be able to put in place new policies and if people committed misconduct or crimes, that they'll be held accountable for them. I think there was way more than just significant questions about the FBI's chain of command management. I think there's significant questions about whether bias bled into this investigation. Before, I want to make sure I understand your testimony here, Mr. Rosenstein. Uh, in August, when you signed the scope memo of 2017, you did not know that in January the 4th, 2017, the FBI field office recommended dropping General Flynn from Crossfire Hurricane, is that correct? Senator, I uh, have no recollection of that. I would think I would remember it. Right. If right. I'd known it, I do not remember that. And the evidence has been recently discovered and turned over to the court in his case, FBI notes. You were not aware of those notes, right? Correct. Thank you. Uh, Senator Kennedy. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. General, as I think you know, we're here to talk about bias and uh, alleged acts on that bias. And it seems to me that it's one thing to talk about bias as a concept or an intellectual proposition, uh, but it's quite another thing to see it in living color. Uh, I, I want to just read you a couple of emails that I think demonstrate the bias in living color and the 
promise to act on that bias. Uh, August 16, 2015, Peter struck. Bernie Sanders is an idiot like Trump. Figure they cancel each other out. February 12, 2016, Lisa, pa Lisa Page. Trump has no dignity or class. He simply cannot be president. March 3rd, 2016, Lisa Page. God, Trump is a most loathsome human. March 3rd, 2016, Peter Strzok. Oh my God, Trump's an idiot. March 3rd, 2016, Peter Strzok. God, Hillary should win 100 million to nothing. March 3rd, 2016, Lisa Page. Did you hear Trump made a comment about the size of his penis? Only she didn't use the word penis earlier. This man cannot be president. July 18, 2016, Lisa Page. Donald Trump is an enormous douche. August 2016, Lisa Page. Trump's not ever going to become president, right? Right? August 2016, Peter Strzok. No. No, he won't. We will stop it. Now, Mr. Strzok and Ms. Page were not junior G-men or G-women. They were senior officials at the FBI. And as I understand it, please correct me, General, if I'm wrong, they were naval deep in misfire hurricane and the Mueller investigation. Naval deep. They were decision makers. And you, you, you made these emails public, which I appreciate. But what we're talking about here is, is not a routine run-of-the-mill FBI case. This was an investigation of the President of the United States of America. And this was the investigation of a presidential campaign. And, and here's what I've never understood. When these emails became public, and you knew about them, when you learned about them, you did the right thing, you made them public. I uh, presume you made them available to Mr. Mueller, um, Mr. Strzok and Ms. Page were, uh, were removed from the Mueller investigation. Nobody, get, nobody gets fired around here. It's easier to divorce your spouse than to fire somebody. Um, but why, why didn't, Rod, why didn't you or somebody, or some other senior official at, 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 at the uh, uh, Department of Justice or the director of the FBI or somebody else senior at the FBI say, wait a minute, Hold, stop, stop a second, I need to, that we're investigating a president and a presidential campaign. I'm going to ask some hard questions here. Maybe I shouldn't have been trusting people that are telling me this stuff. If you or some of your colleagues in the Trump administration had done that, you would have seen that um, the FBI had already said uh, General Flynn didn't do anything wrong. And that the FBI agents who tried to entrap him at the White House had said, well, he's not lying. And y'all, I'm not just putting it on you, but y'all would have found that the Steele dossier was unadulterated BS. And you would have found that, that some people at the FBI had been lying, lying to you lying 
about, uh, uh, about the, on the warrant applications. And maybe you would have said, wow, does, does the Mueller investigation really need to be trying to put Carter Page and, and, and General Flynn? I mean, what's, what's going on here? But nobody did that. And that bothers me. Yep. I appreciate your question, Senator. Uh, first of all, uh, and I have the report open to the appropriate page. You are correct with regard to Inspector Horowitz's conclusions. He did point out that employees are entitled to political views. And I think it's important to recognize, I'm sure we have people with strong views on the other side too. Uh, the question is, are you following the rules? And are you articulating those views in a way that will cast doubt upon the integrity of the process? And when that information came to our attention, Senator, I think we did the right thing. Uh, Inspector Horowitz brought it to my attention uh, and the attention of Director Mueller. Director Mueller took appropriate action. The FBI director transferred Mr. Strzok. The investigation wasn't concluded yet, so he wasn't able to impose any discipline. Uh, I believe uh, the uh, woman involved left the department voluntarily. With regard to the, the uh, status of the investigation, Senator, um, obviously, fortunately, we're at the conclusion and we're able to say that no Americans conspired with the Russians. Um, my impression at the time was that there was proper predication for that investigation. And General Horowitz, Inspector General Horowitz, uh, agreed with that. There may be more information that comes to light, uh, and Mr. Dora may find that, and then I think we ought to take that into consideration as well. Uh, but with regard to all those cases, Senator, I can, all I can tell you is, and I think one more important point I'd like to make, which is why didn't we just throw the whole thing out? It's because there are a lot more people involved in this. It's not just Mr. Strzok and Ms. Page. There are dozens, perhaps scores, of federal agents and attorneys involved, and I, I hope and believe uh, Ms. Ms. most Ro of them were not. Ms. Fired. Rosestone, I think he's asked a very good question. Once you find out that the people who were in charge of Crossfire Hurricane also became the Mueller lead investigators, and they, they, they were dripping with bias, why, didn't they, why wasn't there a time out to do something like the Woods procedure, slow down? Can we really trust the work product of these people? That wasn't done, was it? I, I believe it was. By, well, by will you, will you agree with me it was done very poorly? Because well, you didn't find anything that Horowitz found. How did Horowitz find all this stuff and you didn't? Well, Horowitz, that, that's my internal affairs officer. Well, all I can say is that Senator Kennedy's point is well taken. Yeah. Anybody in their right mind, when they found Strzok and Page were so over the top, yeah. would have slowed down. Look what Horowitz did find. Now, I just can't believe that all this was laying there and nobody could find it if they really mm -hmm. looked. I don't believe you're a part of a conspiracy to defraud the FISA court. I don't believe you're out to get the president. But his point is that this came, this went on for two years. And it was clear that somebody should stop and take a time out, and that never happened. And when Horowitz looks at it in 2019, he found a ton of stuff that well, he, should unnerve all of us. Keep in mind, Senator, and I, I think it's a very valid question you asked, why didn't I do something? And, from my perspective, that is what I do. I refer allegations to the inspector general who works for me. I, I, I think me. the point is he does that, the investigation. that this thing went on two years, and in August 2017, none of the people named in the memo had a tie to Russia at all. General Flynn wanted to be dropped out of the thing, and the, the seventh floor kept him in it. Carter Page was no more a Russian agent than I am a Chinese astronaut. Papadopoulos had said many times, to, uh, when he didn't know he was being taped, it would be treason to work with the Russians. We just don't understand how it started to begin with, to be honest with you, yep. and I think you were very honest up front saying if you knew then what you know now, uh, maybe things would have been different. But that's all this is about, is trying to find out how it went so long. You, yeah. you did a better job with my time than I have. <laughs> but I got one, one other comment. Yeah, what, sure. Um, Rod, this is what really bothers me. Man, a lot about this circus without a tent bothers me, but I really believe the FBI is the premier law enforcement agency in all of human history. And the American people trust it. And you don't want an American, when an FBI agent knocks on your door, to have to go, wow, wow, I wonder if he's a Republican or a Democrat. Exactly. But here you've got a guy like Flynn, and I've never met the general. 
But the FBI had already concluded that um, he didn't do anything wrong. There was no collusion. And it appears that but they were going to take one more shot. Some people at the FBI were going to interview him at the White House, see if we can catch him in a lie. And the agents who interviewed him came back and said, well, I don't think he's lying. And the next thing we know, the prosecutors working for Mr. Mueller are saying, here's the deal. You're going to plead guilty to lying to the FBI. We're going to prosecute your kid. And we're going to break you in the process. I don't think that's justice. I don't care whether you're a Trump supporter or a Clinton supporter or a Biden supporter. Man, that's not justice. If it went down that way, Senator, I would agree with you. And uh, I understand why you've reached that inference. All I can tell you is that uh, I, I certainly was not under the impression that he hadn't lied. As I think I made quite clear, I was under the impression that Mr. Flynn had, General Flynn had willfully lied to the FBI and to the Vice President. So this fact... Uh, but under oath uh, to the this FBI. Fact, this fact that you've put in there that the agents didn't believe that he had lied... Yeah. Uh, uh, I don't recall uh, understanding that at the time, Senator, and, uh, and I, I've read the filing, uh, and I'm sure the General Barr will give us a full readout at the appropriate time. The case is still pending, so we haven't heard the whole story, but if there's any evidence of misconduct there, Senator, I'm confident the General Barr will bring it to light, so I don't think we should jump to that conclusion until we've heard from General Barr about that. Okay. Thank, Thank you, you, General. Thank you very much. Senator Blackburn. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and um, thank you for being here. You know, Senator Booker asked, why were we here? We're here because trust has eroded and, uh, in the FBI and Department of Justice, and you see this carried out by the Obama FBI and DOJ, and people are just, they cannot believe this happened. And you know, I have to tell you, Mr. Rosenstein, when you think about insurrection, Generally, you think about violence, you think about armed criminals, they're taken to the streets, but there are some plots that are there that are done, uh, they're quiet rebellions, and they use the cloak of law to shield them. And you've got where corrupt officials really exploited their powers to destroy careers. You've got partisan hacks that manipulated conspiracy theories to destroy careers, to destroy their political enemies. And these unsubstantiated conspiracies, and this is really what gets us, this has wasted a lot of our time and a lot of money, and it has destroyed the trust and the Mueller witch hunt tried and failed to get rid of a president. And then you had the impeachment, and the Democrats tried that. That tried and failed. And the deal is that the American people should be able to trust the FBI and DOJ to have one set of rules and one standard, and that that will apply to everybody. And we know that that didn't happen. There hasn't been accountability, and there seems to be a double standard, one for the in crowd and a different one for the out crowd. And let's go back to Mr. McCabe. The IG caught him lying three times under oath. And you've said you did not think he was completely forthcoming, I think was your your phrase you used, in his conversation with you. So, if there's a double standard in place, do you think that uh, Andy McCabe should be criminally charged with lying? Senator, I, I don't express any opinion about that. I don't have access to the evidence, uh, and so I'm really not in a position to comment on it. The evidence being whatever information was gathered through the investigation. Okay, so you have no opinion. If he I, lied, I always, if well, he lied, and we know he lied, 
if he willfully lied and it was material and it satisfied the principles of federal prosecution, then yes. Then I, yes, I don't have an he opinion should be about charged. Okay. All right, Michael Flynn was a target uh, because he supported Donald Trump, correct? I do not understand that to be the reason he was a target. Okay. Then let's look at a double standard here. You go back and you look at what happened 10 years ago in the Senate when DOJ prosecutors went after the late Senator Ted Stevens and they withheld Brady material. Mm -hmm. And that was vital and relevant. And it is a tragedy that Senator Sanders, Senator Stevens was exonerated only after he passed. So let me ask you this, is history repeating itself today that the prosecutors that went after Flynn and they withheld Brady evidence and they violated his constitutional rights, so should the charges be dropped against Michael Flynn? Senator, I'm, I'm not gonna comment on the pending case, but I think it's important for you to know, uh, I read the pleading that was filed um, and I know people have jumped to the conclusion that there may have been wrongdoing by the prosecutors. I haven't seen that allegation raised by the Attorney General or by U.S. Attorney Jensen. So you have no opinion if there should be consistency? I believe there should be consistency. You yes. believe there should be consistency. So if you're consistent, then the charges would be dropped, correct? I, I, I don't know. It's hard for me to compare the two cases. Hard for you to say. Okay. Uh, you've got your daughters here with you today. I do. And uh, you've got one that wants to be an entrepreneur and is I'd interested I'd rather not give too many details about my daughters at a congressional hearing. But, in uh, politics. Yes, I'm very proud of them. Let's just say, I know that you are proud of them. We're all proud of our children. And I think many times as a mom and a grandmom to me, it is some of that role playing that does the best. Mm -hmm. So let's say your daughter who's an entrepreneur is wildly successful, rocks the political system, runs for office, and wins, and then she finds out she's been spied on. And then let's say another daughter has followed in your footsteps and gone to DOJ and has become a career, a career DOJ employee and is heartbroken when she finds out that some of the prosecutors and the agents are bending the rules and skirting around and using that to spy on a president. And she comes to you and says, Dad, what should I do? And the other daughter says, Dad, what should I do? Would you want there to be two tiers of justice or would you want there to be one, Mr. Rosenstein? Would you want there to be consistency? I would want there to be would, consistency. You would want there to be consistency. Exactly right. And that is why we are doing these hearings. What was done to President Trump and to his transition team. I was a vice chairman of the transition team to this day. I don't know if they spied on me. See, this is outside of the rule of law. And it is so disappointing to us. And I've come here and I've listened to everybody's questions that you want to punt and kick the can and not give us an answer because if we don't get this right and if we don't straighten out what happened with Crossfire Hurricane and whatever else was in this mix, then my children, your precious daughters, my precious grandsons are not going to have a government that they can believe in and trust to do the right thing. I yield my time. Senator, if I could briefly respond, um, I do not mean in any way to punt. It's simply that I'm not carrying the ball at the moment. So I'm, I'm not in position to know what the evidence is beyond what I'm seeing in the media. And I rely on the people who are in yeah. authority to take the appropriate action. I do not believe that Mr. Mueller was trying to get rid of the president. And I, as I told you, I've, I was working with a team of Trump appointees, and I don't think any of those people believe no. that I was trying to get rid of the president. That's just not, not, not what we were about. With regard to uh, General Flynn, I think that case will be resolved, and if there are allegations of wrongdoing, uh, they'll be remedied. But I, I do think, Senator, it's not a matter of punting. It's simply a matter of reserving judgment, given that I don't have access to the evidence at this time. Well, I just want to say, as we conclude here, that <clears throat> I've always found you to be an honest man, and. I don't think you were part of any conspiracy to get the president. 
But I do believe that General Flynn went through hell, that a lot of things were withheld from the court that mattered. I think Carter Page was abused, and I can't believe the system did not pick it up, and the fact that it didn't is why we're here, to make sure it never happens again. But there's a statement out I want you to respond to, and we'll wrap up the hearing. This comes from Mr. McCabe. Mr. Rosenstein's claims to have been misled by me or anyone from the FBI regarding our concerns about President Trump and the Trump campaign's interactions with Russia are completely false. Mr. Rosenstein approved of and suggested ways to enhance our investigation of the President. Further, I personally briefed Mr. Rosenstein on Jim Comey's memos describing his interactions with the President mere days after Mr. Rosenstein wrote the memo firing Jim Comey. Mr. Rosenstein's testimony is completely at odds with the factual record. It looks to be yet another sad attempt by the President and his men to rewrite the history of their actions in 2017. They have found in Mr. Rosenstein, then and now, a willing accessory in that effort. Would you like to respond? Yes, thank you, Senator. I think one thing you need to appreciate, Senator, is that uh, I had a very strong team working with me at the Department of Justice. I had some of the finest lawyers uh, that I have ever met working with me at the Department of Justice. It was a team. It included Trump appointees. It included career people. I'm sure there were Republicans and Democrats. Uh, and, and that's why I'm confident, Senator, in what I did, because I, I spoke with my team, not Mr. McCabe. I didn't rely on Mr. McCabe. I spoke with my team about the actions that I was taking to make sure that they were appropriate. I did not say that Mr. McCabe misled me. That wasn't my, those were not my words. I think he's responding to somebody's question. What I said was he did not reveal the Call Me Memos to me for a week. And that is true. And he revealed them to me only a couple of hours before they showed up in the New York Times. And he did not reveal to me that he was having internal deliberations with his team about whether to target very high profile people for investigation. And his position is he didn't have to do that until after he had signed off on it. And that may be true under the rules as they were written at the time, but my view, Senator, was that's the kind of thing that I needed to know. Uh, and so I haven't accused him of, of uh, making misstatements to me. I've simply said that he wasn't fully forthcoming. And I think that's accurate. Uh, and I'm confident, Senator, that uh, the folks who work with me will back me up on that. I don't wish Mr. McCabe any ill will. He's suing over his termination. The court will make an appropriate determination about that. But uh, the bottom line is, Senator, for whatever reason, he did not feel comfortable disclosing that information to me for a week. Uh, and I think I should have known that earlier. And I think I had a right to know it. And I think I had a right to know the deliberations in inside the FBI because Mr. McCabe knew I had just come into this job. I hadn't been around for nine months. I didn't know what they were investigating except for what he represented to me. Uh, and that was my only source of information. I didn't have the underlying evidence. I didn't talk to the witnesses. So you were relying on what you were told by the McCabe team, basically, right? I was relying upon the information that came up from the FBI, and I have not made any unfair allegations against Mr. McCabe, Senator. Yeah. Well, I, all I can say as we wrap up here that Mr. McCabe will have the same opportunity you have to sit in that chair or hopefully in a smaller committee room and tell us what happened. And the reason that I think he's an appropriate witness is I find it hard to believe, maybe it's possible, uh, that the subsource, the Russian subsource that was interviewed in January <coughs> and on two different occasions after January 2017, told FBI investigators, counterintelligence analysts that the dossier, which is the primary document to get a warrant against Carter Page, was not reliable. It was bar talk. It was hearsay. It was never meant to be used the way it was being used. I find it hard to believe that when the case fell apart against Carter Page in terms of a warrant application, it didn't work its way up at the top. Maybe, maybe it's just two people at the bottom that withheld exculpatory information. They never shared it with anybody. But that's what we're trying to find out is how could you renew a warrant application in April and June of 2017 when the subsource tells you in January of 2017 the document you need to get the warrants a bunch of garbage. I want to know how you continue to renew those two warrants. Who knew what, when, and where? You say you didn't know. I believe you. But somebody had to know, and Mr. McCabe was the guy most directly in charge, so I look forward to talking with him. We'll hold the record open. Mr. And uh, Yes, please. Uh, I, I just want to be clear about one thing. Okay. Uh, have there been any additional facts 
today that were not in the IG's reports? Yeah, I think uh, what I learned is that the August memo, uh, his team consulted with the, the Mueller team, but the information in the August memo came from the Mueller people. I didn't know that. Mr. Well, Rosenstein, does that let, change your conclusion? Let me just clarify, Senator, that <clears throat> when Mr. Mueller came on board, he inherited the team that was doing the investigation. So it's true that they're the Mueller people, but they're people that he inherited from the well, department. Like Stray, uh, Strzok and Page, right? Correct. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, I didn't know all that. But anyway, a lot more to find out. Thank you very much, and uh, we'll hold the record open for questions and uh, to be continued. Thank you. Thank you, Senator. Judicial Watch President uh, Tom Fitton with us tonight, and he rejected outright former Deputy Attorney General Rod Rosenstein's claims today that he never brought up wearing a wire to spy on President Trump in the White House. You had the Deputy Attorney General of the United States talking to Andrew McCabe, the top FBI official at the time, about wearing a wire and spying on the President in the Oval Office. The same documents, more documents we have from Rosenstein's own email show that that conversation about the 25th Amendment took place. And of course, all part of that discussion was appointing Mueller. So the coup was about three things wearing a wire, invoking the 25th, and appointing a special counsel. 